Young men from across Europe have joined the Waffen-SS during the war. Most striking of all are the hundreds of thousands of men from Eastern and Central Europe, many of whom are at the very bottom of the Nazi racial pyramid. Their reasons for joining are varied, but for most there's the desire to defend their nations from the Soviet Union and the dream of some sort of national independence. But it doesn't take long for these dreams to be proven hollow. The Soviet colossus marches forwards through their homelands while the German military stumbles from disaster to disaster. Now, with the writing on the wall, there is only one hope. Head west. This is a special episode of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. This is part three of our series on the foreign fighters of the Waffen-SS. By now, there are almost half a million non-Germans and Volksdeutsche serving in the ranks of Himmler's armed SS. If you haven't watched the first two parts, I recommend you go back and do so, but I'll briefly recap the story so far. In part one, we saw how the Waffen-SS began recruiting Germanic foreigners from occupied Western Europe and Scandinavia in 1940 and 41. In the second part of the series, we also saw the widespread and often coercive recruitment of Volksdeutsche, ethnic Germans, living in Central and Southern European nations like Hungary, Romania, Croatia and parts of Serbia. On top of this, we saw the widening of the concept of who counts as Germanic, or at least near Germanic. This was particularly apparent in the Baltic, where Estonians and Latvians were recruited and conscripted into Waffen-SS divisions in 1943 and early 1944. More dramatically, we saw the formation of divisions like the 13th Waffen Mountain Division, which recruits Bosniaks, and the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division, which recruits Ukrainians. Himmler justified this loosening of racial boundaries with some creative racism. He claims the Bosniaks have some Persian blood, making them at least partly Aryan. In Eastern Europe, Himmler flat out denies he's recruiting Ukrainians. The men may have Ukrainian names and speak Ukrainian, but Himmler declares that they are actually Galicians, a separate ethnic group that he believes have been partially Germanized by the Austrian Empire. But as we shall see today, in late 1944 and 45, the Waffen-SS goes further than before and the demands of the war lead Himmler to drop even these ideological fig leaves. When we left the story in early 1944, the first wave of recruitment for the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division, the Galician Division, had finished and the troop are undergoing training in occupied Poland. Before their training is entirely completed, the higher SS and police leader in Krakow, SS Obergruppenführer Wilhelm Koppe, orders the division to dispatch a Kampfgruppe to fight partisans. The division's chief of staff, a German officer named Wolf Dietrich Heike, will publish his memoirs many decades after the war. In this, he will mention the reports of the unseemly behavior of the unit began to arrive at the headquarters. He expands no further than this, but whatever happened, he chalks it up to young and inexperienced soldiers, the age-old antagonism between Poles and Ukrainians, and suggests that the Ukrainians were easy scapegoats for German crimes. What Heike fails to mention is that reports of unseemly behavior include the massacres of Polish civilians. In one instance, men of the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division killed between 800 and 1,000 mostly unarmed Polish civilians in a single day at the village of Huta Pienyatska. This is part of the wider four-way civil war in the region between Poles, Ukrainians, Germans, and the Soviets that I've covered last year in special episodes of War Against Humanity. Meanwhile, the rest of the division moves to Neuhammer training camp in Lower Silesia in March and April 1944. In May, the division is visited by Heinrich Himmler himself, who inspects the unit and observes training exercises. He congratulates the officers and men and takes the opportunity to remind them why they fight. The designation Galician has been chosen according to the name of your beautiful homeland, which has become even more beautiful since it lost, through our intervention, those inhabitants who often sullied the name of Galicia, namely Jews. 
Soon after this, the division is thrown into combat. In mid-June, the division is deployed to hold the front near the city of Brody and find themselves in the path of the first Ukrainian front. By mid-July, after suffering fierce Soviet attack and taking part in a failed counterattack, three regiments and two battalions of the Galician division, totaling about 11,000 men, are trapped in the Brody pocket. While in the pocket, tensions rise between the Germans and the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are furious when German troops shoot Ukrainian Red Army prisoners out of hand, while the Germans blame their Ukrainian allies for their perilous situation. This isn't the first time that tensions between Germans and Ukrainians have threatened to boil over. As we saw in the last episode, the Ukrainian soldiers certainly haven't come to think of themselves as semi-Germanic Galicians. Back at the Heidelga training camp, they went around daubing the Ukrainian trident emblem, the Tritsub, on pretty much any surface they could find. Both the leadership of the Ukrainian National Council and the men themselves hope that their division will eventually form the basis of some sort of Ukrainian army in the service of some sort of autonomous Ukrainian state. They're also hedging their bets as to who might bring this about. Many of the officers have been in contact with the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN, and its military wing, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, UPA. Now, trapped in the Brody pocket, the SS men continue to smuggle German weapons, ammunition, and equipment to the Nationalists. In the end, the Galician division is essentially destroyed in Brody. Just 3,000 men make it out of the pocket. Of the remainder, those who aren't killed in battle either desert German ranks and head home, join the UPA, or are captured by the Red Army. For those taken alive by the enemy, execution or the Gulag awaits. Meanwhile, the rest of the division retreats through the Carpathian Mountains as Lviv and Galicia are taken by the Soviets. In August, they are transferred back to Neuhama and the division is rebuilt with new recruits and the integration of other Ukrainian security and police units. As that happens, another Slavic exception to Himmler's racial exceptionalism takes a brutal turn, his inclusion of ethnic Russians of the Rona into the Waffen-SS. This division has its origins with a collaborator named Bronislaw Kaminski, who hails from a mixed German and Polish background in Belarus. Back in 1941, the Germans gave Kaminski control of a republic centered on the town of Lokot. By early 1943, Kaminski had built an anti-partisan militia of about 10,000 men, whom he gave the grandiose title of Russian People's Liberation Army, or RONA. They engaged in the typical rape, burning, and killing of the purported anti-partisan actions. After the failure of Operation Citadel, Kaminsky and his forces retreated alongside German forces to Belarus in August 1943. Despite earlier misgivings about delegating authority to Russians, Hitler secures Hitler's approval to bring Kaminsky into the Waffen-SS, and the 29th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, First Russian, is formed in June 1944. Kaminsky's first task as an SS Generalmajor is to join the notorious criminals of the Dielewange Brigade to crush the Warsaw Uprising. I've covered that in detail in the regular War Against Humanity about the summer and early autumn of 1944. But suffice to say, Kaminsky and his men inflict horrors beyond the worst nightmares of most of us. It is this that proves to be his downfall. There are a few explanations for what comes next, but we can be sure that by the time the uprising is over, Kaminsky has fallen fatally foul of Himmler and German anti-partisan chief Erich von embach Selevsky. The general argument seems to be that Kaminsky's men are so focused on looting and brutalizing that they have no military value. On top of that, Bachselevsky is apparently concerned that their rampage of rape and killing will land him in a post-war tribunal. As soon as replacement units are available, he pulls the Kaminsky men out of combat. Kaminsky himself is hauled before a secret court-martial and executed at the end of August, apparently on Himmler's direct orders. The SS stages a partisan ambush to cover the murder. Meanwhile, in the Balkans, the Hanshar division is playing its own part in the massacres of the Axis anti-partisan warfare. They have been in their Bosnian homeland since March 1944 fighting against Tito's partisans. Much of that anti-partisan work is little more than murder and terror committed against Serbs. They've had some success against Tito, however, and the division fights successfully in Operation Maibaum and Heiderose in May and July. 
But the intensity of fighting and the obvious deterioration of the German war situation are adding to the already existing angst in the ranks. Last episode, we saw how some of the Muslim soldiers mutinied at their French training camp. There were also tensions between the Catholic Croatian soldiers and the Muslim Bosniaks. That isn't help when Himmler forces the Bosniaks to swear an oath of loyalty to Croatian dictator Ante Pavelic, the very man they had hoped to gain more autonomy from. In the autumn, an already serious problem with desertion reaches crisis level. In September, about 2,000 Bosniaks respond to Tito's offer of an amnesty, take their weapons, and leave. These desertions only increase when the division is ordered to leave Bosnia and relocate to northern Croatia. Now, up until this point, Himmler has contorted himself to not blame the Bosniaks for any problems and lose the force. So, so far, he's blamed the French, the Jews, the partisans, and the German officers. But in October, he gives up and orders the disarming of the Bosniaks. Most are sent away to Germany for labor. This is the end for the Bosniak character of the force. The remainder of the German, Volksdeutsche, a few remaining Bosniaks, and Catholic Croatians are reformed as a Kampfgruppe and make a fighting retreat out of Croatia and into southern Hungary. Most of the divisions created this late in the war are formed in Eastern and Central Europe. But there are some exceptions to this. One such exception is the 33rd Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS Charlemagne. This French SS division has its origins in the Légion des Volontaires Françaises contre le Bolchevisme, the Legion of French Volunteers Against Bolshevism, LVF, which was formed in occupied France back in 1941 and fought on the Eastern Front. Recruitment continued in Paris throughout the war, and in 43 they are reorganized as the French SS Volunteer Assault Brigade, part of the 18th SS Volunteer Panzer Grenadier Division. Even as the Germans retreat through France in summer and autumn 1944, they continue picking up collaborators, members of the despised Vigie Security Police, the Milice, and Frenchmen who had served in the Wehrmacht and Organisation Tod. Swelled by new recruits, the Frenchmen are given divisional status in September 1944, although they never count more than about 8,000 troops. Soon, a small fraction of this 8,000 will prove to be some of Hitler's most loyal fighters. Meanwhile, the crisis of the war situation leads the Germans to begin indulging the fantasies of Slavic nationalism they had earlier so firmly opposed. The remains of Kaminsky's unit are transferred over to form part of the Russian Liberation Army led by the defected General Andrei Vlasov. After defecting to the German side in 1942, Vlasov began advocating for Russian independence in cooperation with Nazi Germany. Himmler, Goebbels, and the Wehrmacht were willing to use him for propaganda and recruitment purposes, but had no real intent in fulfilling Vlasov's nationalist ideals. In 1943, they sidelined the general and put him under house arrest after he overstepped the mark during a speech in Pskov. But then, in November 1944, the Germans give Vlasov the chairmanship of the Committee for the Liberation of the People of Russia. On the 14th, Vlasov publishes the Prague Manifesto with 14 points outlining the committee's vision. These include self-determination for Russians, the destruction of Bolshevism, the liquidation of collective farms, freedom of expression, and the freedom of political prisoners. The German indulge him and the committee in a last-ditch attempt to buy off the loyalty of Russians in the Wehrmacht, the SS, and those languishing in prison camps or working as forced laborers. This, in view of the situation, fairly meaningless gesture is repeated with the Ukrainians. In November, Himmler approves the renaming of the division from Galician to Ukrainian, authorizes the men to display the blue and gold national flag, and to play the Ukrainian anthem. A new oath is introduced, which includes the phrase liberation of the Ukrainian people, but still the men have to swear an oath of loyalty to Hitler and the German armed forces. Really, both the Ukrainians and Russians know that there is no chance of liberating their countries, or at least not in partnership with the Nazis. Anyone who can read a map and count divisions knows that the writing is on the wall for the Third Reich. Indeed, Vlasov and his men are already trying to curry favor with the Western Allies. They resist German attempts to insert anti-Semitic rhetoric into the Prague Manifesto, and they only reluctantly insert anti-Western sentences. Pretty soon, he has men making covert appeals for a negotiated surrender to the Western Allies. 
Meanwhile, the Ukrainians manage to separate themselves entirely from the Third Reich. Their final posting is in Austria, where they hold a line running from Gleichenberg to Feldbach until the end of March 45. After negotiations with the Ukrainians, Alfred Rosenberg finally issues a decree recognizing the Ukrainian National Committee in mid-April. The 14th Waffengrenadier Division is transferred to the committee's control to become the 1st Galicia Division of the Ukrainian National Army under Commander-in-Chief Pavlu Shandruk. In theory, this is supposed to be a military force that will go into action against the Red Army and fight for the final liberation of Ukraine. In reality, it's more shuffling around of numbers on paper than anything else. For both the Russians and the Ukrainians, the objective is now the same. Escape capture by the vengeful Red Army and surrender to the Western Allies. Many succeed in this objective, but surrender to the Western powers is no guarantee of an escape from Stalin's wrath. After fighting against the Soviets on the River Oda on April 11th, Vlasov decides to take his division south towards the Americans. Their relationship with the Germans is severed for good on May 5th when Vlasov permits his men to intervene in the Prague uprising on the side of the Czech resistance. As you will see in Indy's coverage for that week, they do manage to hook up with the Americans, but this ploy to get on the western side ultimately fails. Instead, the soldiers get a one-way ticket to Soviet prison camps and Vlasov and the other leaders are hanged in Moscow in 1946. Some of the earliest non-Germanic fighters, the 15th Waffengrenadier Division, that's the first Latvian division, also try to flee into Western safety. They are forced back from their positions on the Pomeranian defenses in early April. Retreating westwards, a large chunk of the division manages to surrender to the Americans at Schwerin on May 2nd. Their counterparts in the 19th Waffengrenadier Division, the second Latvian, don't have the same fortune. Along with other Latvian units aligned with the Germans, they continue fighting in the Kualan pocket up to the very end of the war. They will surrender on May 9th, and 50,000 Latvians will end up in Soviet custody. The Ukrainians are luckier than the Russians and Latvians. On May 6th, they begin marching westwards, and four days later, they surrender to the British at Tamsweg in central Austria. From there, they will be transferred to Rimini in Italy. Because most of the Ukrainians are pre-war citizens of Poland, Shandruk appeals to commander of the Western Polish forces, Władysław Anders, for help. Anders and the British protect the Ukrainians from deportation, and many of them will end up emigrating to Britain and Canada in the years after the war. Other SS foreign fighters are determined to go down with the ship and will fire some of the final shots in Berlin. Now, the Charlemagne division is practically wiped out during the fighting in Pomerania in early April, but one surviving battalion of Frenchmen ends up in Neustadt. There they too face the choice to head towards their own countrymen, surrender, and take the risk of being shot as traitors. Some do, but about 500 men decide to join the final Götterdämmerung of the Third Reich. Along with a few handfuls of Estonians, Danes, Walloons of the Nordland Division, they will fight in Berlin right up to the final battles of the Reichstag and the Reich Chancellery. Whether it's Nazi fanaticism or having crossed the point of no return, the vast majority will die in the service of National Socialism, defending the ruins of the genocidal Third Reich a power that invaded, occupied, exploited their own countries, a foreign force that subjugated many of their countrymen and women to unspeakable suffering under Nazi rule. They may explain their treason with anti-Bolshevism, they may claim that they did it for the better of their country. In reality, they did it in service of anti-Semitic hatred, contributing to the deaths of millions of innocent people. They volunteered with murderous national and ethnic chauvinism, killing men, women, and children they perceived as enemies of their race. They did it with brutal intent to be violent, sadistic bullies and thieves. They did it with a puerile belief that wielding the might of guns made them manly. They did it for dreams of racial hegemony under the Nazi swastika banner, dreams of a new future under German leadership that is now in ruins and soon will be no more than poisonous dust. No matter who or what they thought they were fighting against, they were fighting for Hitler's vision, a vision where men are cowards hiding behind killing machines, where all dignity is forsaken and they, like all of humanity, could never thrive. They fought for a vision of shame, humiliation, suffering and death 
that is now theirs to endure in eternity. Never forget. Thank you.